Housemasters, the hard knock school of everything new construction and remodeling, powered by Home Projects. Now introducing the Home Projects Housemasters, Steve and John with Insulation 101, the radiant barrier myth. It is a great product, but is it for everyone? Welcome to Housemasters, presented by Home Projects. Hi, I'm Steve and this is John. Before we begin, we ask that you please subscribe to our channel and hit like at the bottom. While you're at it, hit the little bell as well to let YouTube know that you would like to be notified when we push new content to our channel. It's very important. We also ask that you make a donation to our cause. Visit our website, click on the donation button. Because without your generous support, we will not be able to continue with this educational platform that you'll be enjoying for the coming months and years. So John, we're here to talk about Insulation 101, the radiant barrier myth. Is it really a great product? Is it really for everybody? Well, um, two answers to you. Uh, it is a great product, um, but it isn't for everybody. And um, there are a number of uh, things that need to be taken into account before you actually entertain the thought of using a radiant barrier in your home. So... Um, and before we get into the, all those uh, details, let, let's go into some one-on-one -on -one information based on what, you know, what is insulation and how does insulation work? Insulation is going to be a material designed to prevent heat or sound from being transmitted from one area to another. Okay. So if you've got heat outside and you're trying to stop it from impeding into your home, you're going to apply an insulation plane. Yep. in between those particular uh, forces there to stop that uh, transfer from occurring. So it's heat, going to be normally, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, so heat moves from um, high pressure to low pressure. And depending upon where you live in the country, um, that could be on the outside of the wall or the inside of the wall. We'll probably go into that in some further episodes. We'll get into some more detail. But I also want to say that insulation is not always just between the studs. It could also be an application to the exterior of the wall, but correct. Enough, yeah. That's enough for me. Now it, it might, you know, insulation is also not just used for heat transfer, but it's also used for sound transfer as well. In a lot of cases, like correct. for instance, if, um, you know, I don't know how many times you've ever come across Steve in your remodeling days where, um, a homeowner wanted to make, uh, you know, their garage, a band room, but, the adjoining dining room to the uh, garage was you could hear every sound coming from their band practice. Yep. So you would apply an insulation that was made for sound travel, um, acoustic insulation, actually, um, as a plane to separate those two particular uh, areas. Yep. It's called, so, it was called sound attenuation blankets, SABs, if you're into acronyms. And there's also an application about how you build the studs to help those those that sound attenuation work better. That's a whole nother conversation. But you you are correct. The insulation helps um, reduce the transmission of heat, um, as well as the transmission of sound. Because frankly, they're both waves, and that's what sound insula that's what insulation is designed to slow down. Yep. To your point, Steve, insulation can work in a number of different ways, and um, it most commonly incorporates the materials used that consist of millions of tiny pockets of air. Yep. A lot of people think that the actual insulation is the like the fiberglass itself. No. It isn't. It's the air around the fiberglass, actually, that's creating the insulation value. Right. And right. that air is an extremely good insulator, and it's, it's trapped pockets of air uh, which are give most types of insulation, they're high thermal resistance. Okay. The effectiveness of thermal insulation is measured by what's known as, as an R value. Correct. Okay. Correct. Now an R value is going to be resistance to heat flow. Okay. And that's what the R, the that's what the R stands for. Literally resistance. Exactly. The higher the R value, the better the thermal insulation it provides. So in other words, if you have a wall, a uh, vertical wall that's R15, it's not going to be as effective, effective in transfer as your ceiling would be at R30. Correct. 
okay? The higher the R value, the longer it's going to take that heat flow to permeate it the plane, okay? It, hence, deriving the higher effectiveness, okay? And it also it, impacts the width of your insulation. Generally speaking, the higher the R value, the thicker your insulation. It's not always true, but 99% of the cases, that's correct. And that's why you just said um, your R value in your ceiling is usually higher than the R value in your wall. And why? Because you often have more space in the attic for that insulation. And in this particular case, you also lose more heat through your attic space as opposed to right. a wall. Now, this next point is extremely important, and it's something that I want everybody to remember for when we start talking about the radiant barrier a little bit later in this episode, okay? In order for an, an, an R value to be calculated, there will always be pass-through that occurs of that particular heat. So in other words, if that heat is not passing through or permeating through that plane, there's no way of calculating an R value. Okay. It's extremely important to remember. Yeah. You had said earlier about uh, pressure differences. Heat flows always from warmer to cooler areas until there's no longer a temperature difference. Okay. And we, we call that temperature difference at what, it, what we call in the uh, industry or building science industry is a Delta T. So in other words, there is a delta in temperature. Delta means difference. That's correct. Okay. And uh, just real quick, people often think that their houses leak cold air, but that's actually not correct. It's That's actually um, hot air leaving your house, not cold air coming in because of the pressure differential. Um, that's a scientific fact. Cold air does not flow into your home. Hot air flows out. Correct. Now, to your point, that means in the wintertime, heat's going to flow directly from all the heated living areas of the house to the, un, or to the adjacent unheated areas. So in other words, you're sitting here in your living room. That's a heated area, okay, in the wintertime that air is going to naturally by physics going to want to transfer to your attic and to the outside yep. of the house or to the garage basement uh anywhere else that's outside of that particular living space because those areas um, have lower pressure correct heat flow can also move indirectly through interior ceilings walls floors, wherever there's a difference in that temperature, that Delta T we talked about earlier. Yep. Okay. Now during the cooling season, heat flows from the outdoors to the interior of the house and the object of the, or the objective of the particular insulation is to stop that transfer process as much as possible. Correct. To main comfort or to maintain comfort in, in a, a house, the heat loss in the winter must be replaced by your heating system and the heat gained in the summer must be removed by your cooling system. So that's where the costs are derived from your heating and cooling bill as to how effective that insulation is. And obviously, you know, some other mechanical issues, you know, that we can talk about at a later date. Um, but that that's in a, in a gist. Yep exactly how your heating and cooling system works in concert with your particular insulation system. Yes. You're actually balancing the pressures. Exactly. Now, properly insulating your home will decrease this heat flow by providing an effective resistance to the flow of heat. That balance you're talking about, Steve. Yep. Now, we get into some, we mentioned R value, okay? Um, some of your most common uh, insulations out there is going to be your bad insulation. It's going to come off in, in rows of, you know, however long. And usually, you know, they're going to be 15 inches wide for a 16 inch on center, or they could be 23 inches wide for your uh, 24 inch on center joists. Yep. But, um, you know, your bats are going to come anywhere from an R7 up to an R, I've seen them as high as R30, 30. in this particular area. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and then obviously with a particular higher R value, you're going to have a higher cost, obviously, um, that's attached to it. Um, foam board. Um, foam board is a product that we used, I mean, like water almost. Um, and we can, we'll get into that in some other uh, episodes. But foam board is a fantastic insulator. Um, again, to what Steve was talking about in terms of thickness, you can take an R12 foam board and it's not going to be anywhere close to the thickness of an R7 bat. Correct. And that's just by virtue of the difference in material, material consistency. But a foam board, you've got polypropylene, um, you've got your polyisocyanurate, which we call uh, polyiso for short. Because you try to say polyisocyanurate three times and you, your head explodes. Yes. Um, but your foam board is going to be used a lot of times on your um, your uh, uh, walls, on the exterior to actually seal a particular wall. Yep. Um, it could be used uh, on the underside of a uh, roof sheathing by chance. Um, there's some real creative methods to use foam board. And, uh, and we can get yeah and foam board is often used um where finishes need to be attached to the building um but the nails or the fasteners themselves would otherwise act as a thermal bridge um because metal conducts heat and cool um, heat and cold very well so if that nail is driven into foam board now that heat or that cold is going to be transmitted directly into an insulator rather than into the cavity of the wall where the bad insulation is. So uh, many people have heard of EFIS. Um, the E and the I in EFIS stand for exterior insulation, essentially a foam board. Now, there's lots of other things that go into that, but um, that's where EFIS, that's why EFIS was so popular, is because it added, now it was not only is it creating an aesthetic look for the home, but uh, it was providing additional insulation. Now, of course, it needed to be installed correctly, and that's a whole other episode. But um, we often use foam boards and bat insulation in conjunction with each other because the foam board does, in fact, allow fasteners to hold exterior finishes onto the house without thermally bridging. When I say exterior f- finishes, John, I'm referring to siding or hardy board or other right. cement boards like that. That's what I mean by exterior finishes. Right. Now, you, you used a term earlier that I want to expound on a tad bit uh, before we go further into the insulated panels and the spray foam. And that word was um, thermal bridging. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's been a debate for years. In fact, the debate's kind of been won uh, over the past 10 to 15 years, I would say. Um, but there's still people that actually believe old school. If you go into an old home, a lot of times you had a uh, product um, it was called cellulose insulation. Okay. They would blow it, uh, into the, into the attic, uh, just like they do, um, uh, fiberglass insulation today or, um, uh, blowing wool. Um, but a number of your older homes had bat insulation laying in between the floor joists of the attic. And the downside to a bat being used in that particular application is the fact that when you take, you have an insulation value of your particular bat, but then you have, when you're, when you're doing a HERS rating, say, on a home, or you're trying to test from a scientific standpoint on a home, how effective the home is being insulated, you have to take what's called the overall effective insulation value of that attic, okay? And when you, are applying a bat insulation to the attic, you have to account for the joists, okay? Those Thermal joists also bat. have an insulating value, but it's not equal to what the bat's insulation value is. Correct. So if you put an R30 bat in there and every 16 inch on center, you have a, a floor joist that might be R4, those R4 floor joists have to be taken into account over the entire spread of that particular attic space. Correct. So while you think you are putting R30 insulation in with a bat, your effective 
insulated value for that attic might end up being 26 or 27 because those R4s have to be counted or calculated into that effective value. Correct. And I and, and you're going to do offer a solution to that problem here a little bit later in the episode. Correct. Um, but I, it's something that a lot, it, it doesn't happen very often, but you see some people that are just hell bent on putting bats up in the attic and it's, it's just not the best thing to do. Correct. Uh, and, and I felt that it was valuable that we, we talked about it. So what now in turn, so what other, ahead, one other solution you're going to talk about a very effective solution later, but another solution to that is actually covering those floor joists up with the actual insulation. Um, and you can't do that with bat insulation, at least not effectively, because bats literally come in kind of like these pre-made blankets. They're not very extremely flexible. But um, in order to cover the floor joist up, you could use blown insulation, as you mentioned before, which is essentially the same material as bat insulation, but it's blown into little tiny little chunks. And that can be directed over the floor joists um, so that the floor joists themselves are insulated from the attic, and therefore the floor joist doesn't um, provide that thermal bridging uh, and detract from the R value of the bad insulation around it. Right. Now you have a lot more experience on the insulated panels than I did. Yep. So I'm going to let you go ahead and talk a little bit, bit more about that. Yeah. So insulated panels. Um, so this is actually kind of a, a, a more of a hybrid system. Um, this is not just insulation. The insulated panels are, can be structural and they can be architectural. Um, and in many cases, they could also be used in conjunction with other materials like concrete to create a, uh, a sandwich of a wall that, um, that provides an extremely high R value. But insulated panels, IPs is what they refer to in the industry, um, are a bit pricier because they do, in some cases, replace the structural component of your wall. Unlike a foam board, which has to be nailed to a stud, whether it's metal or, or wood, um, that foam bore has some structure to it in the sense that it can hold the exterior siding on the building like we talked about, but it's not gonna hold the house up. Um, where an insulated panel, if designed correctly, is actual structural. So, like I said, sometimes they're integrated with concrete um, and there's lots of systems out there. You can just Google uh, insulated panel and you'll find all kinds of different stuff. And uh, there's lots of different technologies that go into them, but usually they are associated with the structural integrity of the wall. They replace the structure or enhance the structure at some point. Um, and they have uh, a very high uh, insulation rating based on their thickness. If you notice on the chart on the screen, we're getting, not only are we getting into the more expensive upper end of insulation, but the R value per inch is, cr is climbing rapidly. So where uh, with a bad insulation, if you have a two by four wall, which in our market, a lot of people have two by four walls. We'll talk a little bit more of the value of a four versus a six a little bit later. But if you have a two by four wall, the most bat insulation you can get in there is 13. That's all you're gonna get. If you're lucky and you add a foam board to the outside of it, you're gonna add 18 to it, okay? So now we're up to your effective insulation panel is now, was that 30? And so the bat and the foam board added together are 30. But an insulated panel is an R33 for that same thickness. So it's an extra three. And the dollar symbols for that one insulated panel are less expensive than the bat and the foam board added together. So there's some value to it as you move up the range. But, um, you know, as with everything we talk about, John, everything could be its own episode. So I'll stop right there. No, you're right. In fact, I mean, as you were talking, I was thinking about, you know, um, you mentioned, um, you know, the thickness of a two by four wall versus a two by a two by six wall. Yeah. Um, one, one thing that a lot of people don't understand with fiberglass insulation is, and, <laughs> and to be honest with you, it's, uh, it's uh, a lot of contractors, believe it or not. How many times have you seen on a job site, Steve, a um, uh, new construction job site where a contractor will install a window and they jam fiberglass insulation as much as they can around the actual uh, frame of that window um, to, to seal it off and, uh, and insulate it? I see it all the time. 
it, I mean, it's not as prevalent today as it used to be, say, five years ago, because, you know, you have the, the coming of the age of spray foam. Yeah. But actually what they're doing when they do that is they're doing a disservice they're, to they're, the actual uh, perimeter of that window. Right. They're, because they're reducing they, the air value, the air insulation around it. Exactly. What's it. happening is, again, we spoke earlier about, you know, fiberglass insulation and the actual insulated value of that insulation being in the air pockets, not the fiberglass itself. When you scrunch that fiberglass up to one another and squeeze it, it becomes solid matter. Solid matter then becomes conductive. Correct. Okay. So there you're allowing, just like wood would, um, a transfer of heat and cold uh, through that particular window perimeter. Okay. Yep. That's the beauty of what we're about to get into right now with the spray foam. Okay. And before you go into that, I will, I will say that the insulated panels, um, because of their, their sandwich technology, the compression of fiberglass around a window is not as important with an insulated panel as it is with a, a, a traditional wood framed wall, because those gaps don't exist. The window, the rough opening for the window is much tighter to the actual framing dimension of the window than it would be with a wood framing. So, but, but you're correct. You're leading into a, another technology here that kind of helps all three of these coexist uh, together and, um, and solve some of those pressure differential, the Delta T issues we were talking about earlier. Spray foam is your newest and greatest. Uh, you've got two different types of spray foam out there that are prevalent. You got your open cell and your closed cell. We're not going to get into the science behind both of those, but your spray foams are going to be used obviously around perimeters of windows and doors to stop uh, heat transfer there. Um, around um, uh, your uh, light units. Uh, so in other words, if you have insulated can lights uh, in your ceiling, a lot of times you're gonna see spray foam around those. Um, uh, any penetration leading from the living space to the non-living space or un uh, uninsulated areas of the house. Or the exterior. Um, uh, to the exterior are, it should have spray foam in those particular penetrations. Uh, now we're getting a little bit into what a further episode will be in terms of uh, air sealing uh, a home, but you know, and we're trying to lay out as exactly what the utility is of these particular spray foams that we're speaking about here. Spray foam is also widely used on the underside of a uh, roof sheathing, roof sheathing. Um, to uh, condition an attic, say, um, very common in, in that particular uh, uh, sphere. So, um, so we've got bats. We talked about the blown in. It's not on this list here. Uh, you got your foam board, your insulated panels, and you got your spray foam. And then obviously uh, you have your uh, differing uh, R values on each of them. Anything you wanted to add to that, Steve? No, I, you're right. We've got several other episodes coming up. We could dive into each one of these in great detail. I have a million things going through my head what spray foam is great for, but they're all involving heat, uh, air infiltration, as you said. So, uh, you know, I, I was an Energy Star uh, um, builder and very familiar with the Energy Star program and, um, and Energy Star framing techniques, insulation techniques. And like I said, we'll get into a lot of that when we talk about it in more detail. This is supposed to be a 101 level, so we, we can't jump into the 401 right off the bat. <laughs> yeah, you got to get that um, that bachelor's and those core subjects out of the way before you can go through your master's. That's right. So anyway, um, uh, let's talk about three different types of heat flow, okay? First type of heat flow is going to be conduction. We talked uh, briefly about that in the last segment here. Conduction is the way heat moves through materials, okay? So in other words, like when you have a spoon and you place it in a hot coffee cup, it conducts heat through its handle to your hand, okay? So you got a hot coffee cup, you put the spoon into it, and the next thing you know, within the next couple of seconds, the handle of the spoon is actually yeah. hot. And it's um, eventually it will become close to as hot as the particular coffee that it sits in. 
that heat is actually conducting through the material of that spoon to your particular hand, okay? The next way of heat flow is going to be convection, okay? And convection heat is the way heat circulates through liquids and gases and is why lighter, warmer air rises and cooler, denser air sinks in your home, okay? So you got conduction and convection. The call third it, one is going to be, go ahead, Steve. They call it a convection cycle. That's the actual technical term for it, when the heat, heat transfers from high to low. Yes. In fact, you've probably heard of, of a convection oven. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to give you a, a, a much th more thorough cook um, uh, at the end of, you know, cooking a steak or whatever you put into the oven uh, with a convection oven. So you got conduction and convection. The third one is going to be radiation. Okay. And radiation is, it travels in a straight line and heats anything solid in its path that absorbs its energy. So in other words, um, you take a piece of plywood and you're in the middle of building a house on a hot July summer day. It's a hundred degrees outside. And that's a three quarter inch piece of plywood there. And eventually and it's not going to take very long at all on that july hot summer day but that attic beneath that plywood is actually going to become very hot a, a, a heat source okay and in most cases once it's all closed up it's going to be a lot hotter than the actual uh air outside so it's a straight line transfer through anything solid in its path okay now in order for a product to have our value as we spoke earlier there has to be a calculated heat flow through a plane of material. So in other words, if there is not that permeance, there is no R value. Okay. That's extremely, I know I stressed it earlier in this episode, but I wanted to restress it as we move along here. It's going to be always recommended that insulation levels of a home are maximized to recommended levels for a particular geographic zone with proper air sealing, of all penetrations present in the plane being insulated before any other prescription methods are used, okay? Again, we'll get into this in future episodes in terms of air sealing and all that, but I spoke something in terms of geographic zone. You have a number of zones set up by the EPA uh, where I th think, Steve, it's, I know it changes every couple of years here in North Carolina, it but- does, yeah. it does, at one point, we were in zone three. Uh, what zone are we in right now? Yes, John, we are currently still in zone three in our in our um, location. Um, the microclimate around us is changing. Um, you know, there's lots of reasons for it, but um, to the south, it's uh, creeping up towards us, which will move, quickly move to a four, and from the north, it's coming down towards us from a two. But um, it doesn't change dramatically over time. Um, but it's something that the code recognizes and uses that microclimate zone, that number, to help determine what your R value is required in your wall ceilings and floors and other penetrations in the home. So now we've explained how insulation, whatever form, reduces uh, conductive heat flow. Again, the higher the R value, the less conduction is going to occur. Or to better explain it, the slower the conduction will be. Okay. Now, what is radiant barrier? Radiant barrier is a highly reflective material that remits radiant heat rather than absorbing it, reducing cooling loads. Okay, let me say that again. A radiant barrier is a highly reflective, reflective material that remits radiant heat rather than absorbing it, reducing cooling loads. So in other words, when you have a, an overabundance of heat in a particular area and you want to stop that heat from radiating into adjoining living space or not even living space from another space that's adjacent to it, let's say, you would use a radiant barrier to stop that transfer. Okay. And R value has no inherent R value. Again, what do we talk about that's, that needs to be present in terms of having an R value? You have to have permeance of transfer, okay? Permeance or transfer of particular heat in order to calculate an R value. 
Now, although it is possible to calculate an R value for a specific radiant barrier or a reflective insulation installation, the effectiveness, uh, the, the effectiveness of these systems lie in their ability to reduce heat gain by reflecting heat away from the living space. Okay, so you can get into these ridiculous algebraic equations to get to a particular effective R value. It, don't pay attention to it, right? Okay. So effectively, the radiant barrier is not insulating anything. It is simply refusing to let the heat into the space by rejecting it as you as it's you, shielding it's, it it's shielding it's shielding it. It. like a like a yeah that's what it's doing so um we, we mentioned before that in like you said insulation um uh, is, is insulating with air pockets tiny little air pockets to to prevent heat from transferring through the space this doesn't even let the transfer happen it just simply blocks it and kicks it out so it's, right. it's often used in conjunction with some of the other systems we were talking about earlier. Exactly. Now, when should a radiant barrier not be used? There's a number of times where it shouldn't be used. And it's this, you know, we talked about it being a fantastic product, yep. but it's not for everybody. Okay. Correct. So when the level of insulation in a certain area of the home does not meet the prescribed level of R value for the geographic zone in your home that your home resides in, you don't need a radiant barrier. Correct. So in other words, if you have not maximized your R value in your attic, you have no business putting radiant barrier. Up. You're not, you're not ready for it yet. No. Now could be a good enhancement. And we'll talk about that, but before you do anything, you need to make sure that the R value is max uh, prescribed for your geographic zone that your home resides in is to the level it, it needs to be. So if it's R38, um, it needs to be at R38 at a minimum. Okay. The next um, time or the next uh, example of a radiant barrier not being used would be if the heat HVAC ductwork in your attic or crawl space basement is not properly insulated, okay? HVAC uh, ducts come in a number of different ways. You've got flex duct, which has a built-in insulation in it. Usually that is an R8, uh, at least in this particular climate zone. Um, you have uh, metal ductwork that um, is used. Again, it's insulated to R8. Your old metal duct work was insulated to R2 or 4. So you got to make sure that you know what type of metal duct work you might have. Um, but if it's not up to the particular uh, code for your particular geographic zone, again, radiant barrier does no good for you. Okay. If your attic is not properly ventilated with an appropriate soffit and ridge vent system coupled with a proper cross ventilation from gable lens, which is your ideal ventilation system, okay? Yeah. And what I mean by that, what I mean by soffit is the area of your overhangs where your roof comes down to your gutter and it intersects with the vertical outer walls of the house, okay? So that overhang area is an area where we want ventilation to occur. We want, we want air to come into that particular soffit and then out through your ridge vent system at the ridge of your roof, okay? And that creates a convection current like this. Yep. On top of that, and this is something that's been debated. Um, uh, you know, there's smart people on both sides of the equation uh, that disagree here. Ideally, I like gable vents um, because it creates a cross ventilation on top of that convection. Yep. Uh, there's a lot of building scientists though that don't like the uh, gable vents they would rather uh, have your um, your passive uh, vents like your solar vents in the roof um, you got your what we call whirly birds yeah. Um, yeah. that spin on top um, I tend to think and this is just my opinion uh, I tend to think that those whirly birds and solar uh, ventilation systems 
uh, break the convection current that we're trying to create between the soffit and the regiment. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Steve? Well, there's, I have two thoughts. Uh, first of all is that um, the ventilation, what you're talking about, attic ventilation, has two purposes. Uh, one is to evacuate um, hot or cold air, depending upon what season, whether you're heating or cooling. The other is also, um, we were talking about pressure differentials earlier, the attic, the E vent and your, and your ridge vent work in, 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 in parallel with each other to make sure air flows through your attic to make sure you don't have a difference in pressure on the outside of your attic and the inside of, the pressure, uh, inside of your attic. Because your roof, under high wind conditions, will actually become a wing. W-I-N-G. And what happens to wings when they have more pressure uh, inside the attic than they do outside the attic? Lift occurs. And so one of the number one ways to, to eliminate your roof being blown off in a tornado or a high wind storm is to make sure that it doesn't act like a wing and produce that negative pressure. And so you do that by installing eave vents and ridge vents so that air flows through your attic at the same pressure that it flows outside your house. So that's a little known detail that most people don't associate with eave vents and attic vents. And then, to your point, if you add in gable vents, you have shortened, sh shorted that process. Um, you're now introducing a preferred prefer differential from a different element in the home which impacts the delta pressure. And so again, I'm, I'm diving into a very uh, detailed discussion about pressure differentials, but most people think the attic vents and the ridge vents are simply evacuating hot air from your attic, but they are in fact helping your, keep your roof on in, in pressure differential situations like high wind or hurricanes. But I agree with you that um, you should have one system or the other, not both, because they will start to fight each other over time. Now, a lot of old homes had gable vents in them because they didn't have overhangs or ridge vents. So the gables was really the only way to, for them to evacuate. But oftentimes, the gables were not situated in an in area to get cross ventilation adequately. So they did nothing. Um, are you familiar with the, um, the movie uh, uh, Christmas Vacation? Yeah. Well, there's a hilarious scene where he is... In the attic, um, I think he got up there because the, the attic door closed on him. He's up there watching home movies and having a moment. And he goes and sticks his head out the uh, gable vent um, to yell at his family because he watches them dri drive away. Every time I see that, that episode, that, that scene, I think of this very discussion that his attic vents are doing zero work. Because <laughs> otherwise the attic would be frozen up there. The The attic would be the same temperature as the outside and the meager blanket he was wearing wouldn't wouldn't do any good for him. So uh, I know that's just a stage set, but I, I always think of that when I when I see that. But I agree with you 100%. It's a long way of saying it. I agree with you that um, one system or the other, not both, and I prefer EVE through uh, ridge vent, vent ventilation. And that's actually um, one going to contribute to one of the reasons why you shouldn't use this product in some places too, and I'll let you continue with that. Okay. Uh, radium barrier is not recommended for crawl spaces or unconditioned basements due to the low delta T between the living area and these particular spaces. Uh, so in other words, you know, you might have, uh, you might be trying to realize a 68 degree temperature in your living area, but your attic in the summertime uh, might be 130. Yep. So say it's at 70 degrees and your, your attic is 130. You got a 60 degree Delta T there. Okay. Whereas in the crawl space, being that it's usually always shaded and, you know, you got ventilation, uh, you got your vents, uh, crawl space vents. It's a lot cooler. Mm -hmm. So, Again, using that 70 degrees as a round number of what you're trying to uh, keep your living space at, your crawl space may be at 82 degrees. So there's only a delta T of 12 there. Okay. Yep. So your, 
the effectiveness of using a radiant barrier in that particular application is just not there. You're not going to, the ROI is not there. That's, yeah, um, that's more important, return on investment. Right. So you could gain a little bit of benefit, but it's just, I mean, it'd have to be down there for the next 60 years for you to actually be able to pay it off. Um, doesn't make any sense. Right. And there are other, again, there are other measures that you can take to be able to uh, regulate the, uh, the balance between those two particular um, spaces that we'll talk about in future episodes. But in all of these cases above, these individual systems must be upgraded to code or above before entertaining the thought of applying a, a radiant barrier. So in other words, if the R value is not at the geographic zones requirement uh, where your home resides, if the ductwork is not properly insulated in your crawl space, uh, attic or basement, um, if your attic's not properly ventilated, uh, as we discussed in detail, um, and then crawl spaces and basements are not a good place for this particular application. All four of these instances here, um, something needs to be done before applying a radiant barrier. Yes. Okay. Now, when does a radiant barrier need to be used? Okay. Or when can it be used is a better uh, term to use. Can I add one more reason not to use it before we move on? You can. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> um, and, you know, we're all about the school of hard knocks here. This is a, this is a, a lesson I learned when I was doing passive solar home design. And, um, and uh, I quickly realized that you, me well, you mentioned before, this stuff reflects heat rather than allowing it to transmit through the space, it reflects it. Well, your roof shingles, in most instances, um, a radiant barrier underneath them um, is a detriment to your roof shingles. Uh, I mentioned before the a function of your eave hang overhangs and your ridge vent vents allow air circulation through the attic for lots of different reasons. One of the other reasons is that it ventilates the heat off the back of your shingles, whether they're asphalt, whether they're wood, in some cases metal. And the, the shingle manufacturers assume, if you look in their manufacturer's instructions and their warranty, that you are properly ventilating your attic space. If you have a vaulted space or a bonus room underneath your shingles, you have to put a baffle in there that allows air to pass underneath your shingles um, between the back of the shingles and your insulation. That is to ventilate your shingles. It's, it's part of the building code and good building science. If you have this material underneath the shingles, not only are you insulating yourself from the air and ventilation that's happening in the attic, but now the heat that just came through the shingle is being bounced back through it. So the shingle is now being subjected to heat times two. And in many cases, this material will void the warranty of the shingles because of that very physical property. Now there's ways of getting around that. And there are specific materials you can buy that, that don't do that. But before you go put this material on your roof underneath asphalt, especially asphalt shingles, make sure that the manufacturer recommendations allow for that. Also something that I will add, if you have blown in insulation in the attic to help with what you're talking about there, um, you should have baffles at the soffit yes. to uh, directional uh, or to add a directional airflow from the soffit to that particular ridge vent. Yes. Okay. If you do not have the proper baffling, uh, at your soffit areas, um, you need it before you, you put a radiant barrier. Correct. In, okay. Um, so now you're going to talk about all the reasons you should use it. <laughs> yeah. When all of these above systems have been installed to the appropriate local code or above, as we uh, discussed, and an overabundance of heat still exists in the area, such as an attic, a radiant barrier is a good uh, measure to use, Correct. okay? While it does not hold an effective R value, it can be used to enhance the R value of an already installed insulation by lessening the probability of uh, the insulation being saturated with heat, okay? So in other words, if you've got R38 insulation uh, in your attic, it's 100 degrees outside, 
that attic with a proper um, roof ventilation system is probably going to be somewhere in the in the realm of 112 to 122 maybe yep on average a lot of factors go into that you know uh sun exposure shade coefficients so on and so forth but you know a, a north south house uh in the summer 112 to 122 is a good average uh temperature in the in the heat of summer um now again like, let, let's say it's 120 degrees and you're trying to keep that living area below it 70 you've got a delta of 50 degrees okay Radium barrier is probably a good um, type of application to use in that scenario, okay? Uh, what it's going to do is it's going to enhance the insulating value. It's not going to increase the insulating value, but it's going to enhance the insulation effectiveness of the insulation that's in that attic, okay? And stop that transfer from occurring uh, as much as as it would without it i have seen uh attics that were upwards of 140 degrees in the dead of summer july august september have a radiant barrier installed and the attic is 10 degrees above living to living uh space temperature that's how effective a radiant barrier can be if by if used in the proper ap application. And if you're able to reduce that delta from 50 to 10, yep. you, you're you're doing exactly everything that you need to do. So the radiant barrier will actually reduce how much work your insulation has to do. Exactly. Um, and that's why we said you need as much insulation as possible before you do this, because if you don't have the proper insulation in there the vapor barrier will will reduce how much heat gets into your house yes but nothing once it gets through the vapor the radiant barrier there's nothing to keep it from going into your living space so that's why john was beating the drum beating the drum being the drum you have to insulate correctly first and then you put this in there it just helps reduce the amount of work it has to do right now there's a second major benefit to a radiant barrier in that particular application. Um, we've talked about HVAC ductwork yep. uh, before, and by code, um, HVAC ductwork is supposed to be in this particular zone um, insulated to R8. Okay, R8 is not a whole lot of insulation, and when you have 130 degree temperatures in the attic, and you only have R8 stopping heat from entering that duct and you're trying to realize a temperature of 70 degrees in the house, that's kind of rough. So when you apply a radiant barrier, not only is it enhancing the effectiveness of the existing insulation on the floor of that attic, but it's also enhancing the insulation around that HVAC duct. So in other words, you're also reducing the delta between obviously the airspace uh, in the attic, but reducing that temperature in the attic is reducing the uh, temperature inside the duct as well. So if you're trying to realize 70 degrees off of a, an air conditioning unit and you're blowing air that's 90 because there's 130 degree temperature in the attic, that doesn't create a very efficient heating and cooling system. And it makes, excuse me, it makes that heating and cooling system need to work much harder than it needs to. So if you're able to reduce that delta as much as possible with that radium barrier, it's going to have a major effect on your heating and cooling system, just in terms of the duct work itself. Yeah. Okay. And you're, you're starting to flirt with some sealed attic um, technologies and some other systems we'll get into in some other, other videos, but um, you're, you've, this particular material uh, complements a sealed attic system, which of course is hugely beneficial to your HVAC loads. And in a lot of cases, this is gonna be a lot less expensive than the sealed attic Absolutely. is gonna be as well. Yeah, and sealed attics have their own issues also that this right. product does not introduce into the home. Now, 
let's get into a subject that's been debated round and round for for ages. Um, how should a radiant barrier be installed? Um, I have my opinions. Uh, there are others in the industry that have equally valuable opinions. Um, I tend to be a very logical person where um, I, I have to look at all the conditions of a particular space in the home before I decide as to which way is going to be the best. But um, it, the debate lies with whether the radiant barrier should be installed on the underside of the roof uh, rafters or laid across the uh, top of the insulation that's blown in the attic, okay? I am a firm believer that it should be stapled up to the underside of the roof rafters. Yes. Now, one thing that I need to, I need to emphasize with radiant barrier. You have products out there, for instance, you have plywoods out there, you have foam boards out there. The foam board uh, products with radiant barrier scrims are fantastic products, okay? But with a foam board, there actually is a, an air pocket behind it because that foam's got air inside of it. Yep. With a piece of plywood, there isn't any air, okay? So the actual effectiveness of plywood that's got a radiant barrier paint applied to it on the, on the bottom side usually is not the most effective application, okay? But when you're using a rolled radiant barrier product, the manufacturer is always going to require at least an inch air gap between the heat plane and the barrier itself. And that allows for an area of reflection. Yep. Okay. Um, sitting a radiant barrier over top of insulation, for one, there's weight to the radiant barrier. I'm not a proponent of weighing down the thickness of blown in insulation because when it's weighed down, it loses its R value. Number one. Two, I am not big on laying a perforated solid sheet across an entire plane over X amount of square feet at a flat, uh, on a, in a flat way, because it's just begging dust and debris and everything else to, to gather on it, which is effectively going to, in the long run, Eliminate reduce it. the effectiveness of that particular uh, reflective um, material. Uh, material. So that's why I don't personally believe in putting it down on the floor. Um, you know, some people disagree and I'd be glad to hear your uh, comments or questions uh, at the bottom uh, after this video. But I can tell you that never once uh, did my company ever install radiant barrier on the floor. It always installed it at the roof level. And the other major benefit is, is when you install it on the roof level, it's doing nothing to the temperature of the attic itself. Whereas when you put it at the underside of the roof rafters, you're effective, you're affecting the entire attic temperature. Correct. So if by chance you have storage in that attic, you know, you have your old knickknacks and Christmas decorations and wax candles and, you know, all those types of things. Uh, a radiant barrier on the floor is going to do nothing to protect those particular uh, items. And it won't also improve your efficiency of your ductwork either because your ductwork will be above it in the, in the heated attic space. Um, well, in a lot of cases, Steve, they actually will, it will drape, drape it over, it over. top of the, yeah, but still, I mean, it, it ends up being a, it, it doesn't, it, the other thing is it's not a professional looking job. Yeah, that doesn't sound right to me. And, if, and you know. if you're using your attic for storage, you've eliminated your ability to store stuff up there because that would essentially mean you're not going to put the, the radiant barrier over the areas where you have storage plywood. So now you basically have a big window in your attic where you don't have that radiant barrier um, to allow for the storage. And for anyone who has to get into the attic to maintain your mechanical systems, that barrier is going to be in the way. 
Um, there's just a plethora of reasons why I, I disagree with that as well. Attaching it to the bottom side of the um, roof rafters or to a baffle system an inch away from the underside of the shingles, that's the way it should be done, in my humble opinion. Well, your humble opinion is as, as legit as I've heard, because, I mean, that's exactly the way I look at it. And, um, you know, again, I, I've never uh, had my guys install radiant barrier in any other fashion than other than the other side of the roof rafters um just by virtue of all the benefits that are lost by not doing so yeah. so one uh, one thing that i want to add to this episode before we we shut down um you have a number of companies out there that uh in fact you have companies that all they do is sell radiant barrier um those are not companies that you want to do business with. Okay. Uh, and the reason, or the, the main reason why I say that is they're going to try to sell radiant barrier to every home that they go to, Correct. regardless of whether you need it. Okay. They're not taking the building science approach and applying a, a thorough diagnosis of where the house is sick before they provide a solution. All they're doing is providing an item. Okay. And there's a big difference between providing an item versus providing an actual solution. Okay. Um, you have these products, uh, you have these companies and products that are saying, well, it's equivalent to R14. <laughs> no, it's not. Again, um, it, it, it's, it, it's snake oil. Um, any contractor that ever tells you that radiant barrier is equivalent to X. I don't care what R value they put on it. For one, they either don't know what they're talking about or two, they're a bold faced liar. Um, and in some cases they could be both, yeah. but um, you don't know how many homes or homeowners would call us and say, Hey, I understand you guys do radiant barrier. I want you all to come out and give me an assessment and give me a price. And I'd get out to the house and I would literally talk them out of radiant barrier and talk them into doing something that might be less expensive or it might be more expensive, but it was more effective and it was going to create a larger solution for their actual problem that they were having. Um, I did the same thing with windows. I, I talked more people out of windows than I talked them into windows. Um, you know, that's the sign of, you know, having credibility as a contractor, you know, where you're able to, you're willing to walk away from a, a, uh, a known sale. Um, but, you know, I always applied to building science behind things before I would actually provide the solution. And it's just like when you go to a doctor's office, you don't just walk in and you he asks you, uh, well, what's your symptoms? Well, I got a sore throat. Well, you got strep throat then. Right, we're going to go ahead and give you some erythromycin and we're going to give you some cough medicine. That's not the way a doctor's office visit goes. And nor should a visit of a contractor walking into your home trying to prescribe a product to you. Okay. Again, there is a huge difference between providing products and providing solutions. And what we always did was provide solutions because we always knew that we were going to have to answer to that homeowner in the long run. So Radiant Barrier has been one of those things that, uh, you know, it, it's very, it's a cool product. Um, cool being, you know, like, you know, groovy type cool. Um, you know, uh, it is a space age type product. It's product that they use, in, you know, as insulation for, uh, you know, astronauts and, you know, types of, you know, radiant barrier qualities are used for that. Um, but, you know, these, these contractors that push it on every job, they, that's all they, that's all they hang their hats on is that NASA uses it and that it's equivalent to X R value. And, um, when you hear somebody say that to you, uh, and you, uh, see somebody charging you eight to $12 a square foot to lay it run as fast as you can, because, uh, it's not something, it, it's not a contractor that you really want to do business with on an average home. Um, Radiant barrier uh, cost and labor should not be more than say a dollar fifty to two dollars a square foot. 
And now when I say square foot, I'm talking about surface space in the attic that is being covered. So in other words, square footage of the actual roof sheathing, not square footage of the house. So if you've got a 1700 square foot house and you've got 1200 square feet uh, in a uh, roof sheathing, your cost is going to be somewhere in the range of roughly about 1800 bucks or so, give or take. If you're seeing prices from a contractor in four or five and six range, kick them out of the house as quickly as possible. So uh, that wasn't something that was actually uh, on the list to talk about, Steve, but I thought it was extremely yeah. important yeah. that they knew um, because there are some uh, contractors out there that uh, are in it for a uh, quick dime. It is an easy product to sell. Um, and uh, the benefits are easily conveyed to a homeowner, but you, uh, you have to understand the science behind everything. And um, hopefully this episode has uh, brought you up to speed to understand insulation uh, the way it should be understood and um, where and when you need to use these particular uh, products to maximize the benefit that you're looking for and uh, keeping your home comfortable and healthy uh, for your family. So I will push it over to you, Steve, if you want to add something uh, to what we've talked about here. No, I, I don't have anything to add other than we've got a lot more to talk about, about this um, air infiltration and home insulation in, in general, um, many more episodes. So this was literally a one-on-one introduction. Um, if you're listening to this and you have questions, please, 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 please post them below in the comments. If it's something you don't want the rest of the world to read, go to our website, homeprojects.com, and there's a link to our private email addresses there. Send us an email. Uh, we'll be more than happy to, to uh, give you some advice on your specific um, context because every house is different. Um, and every house, as John said, you have to take the entire system into consideration. Uh, obviously, we can't come look at your individual house unless you happen to live near us, but um, we can certainly help you uh, the best we can. Share this video, please, with, with friends and family, um, anyone who might not fully understand what insulation does, let alone um, radiant barrier. Give us comments. Um, subscribe to the channel. Um, like this video particularly. All this helps us with Google um, search and prior, uh, optimization on our website. The better search results we have the more likely that someone else out in the ether is going to find us that didn't know we were here so that's really why we're asking you to do this um and uh by all means come back and check us out on our ne next episodes peruse some of the videos we already have see uh, what they might how they might help you out there's quite a bit of stuff on the website right now and we hope to look, look forward to seeing you in the near future thank you very much don't forget to like our video and subscribe. Leave a comment or question while you're at it. Your support is very important. Visit www.homeprojects.com to donate via PayPal or GoFundMe. Thank you. Thank you.